Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. He is risen. He is risen in me. Oh, you're doing so well with that. Easter, the ultimate test of our faith. It's the one great watershed that divides unbelievers from the faithful. The resurrection from the dead. St. Paul confirmed that for us when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. The women go to the tomb early that Sunday morning, and the angel greets them with the message of the resurrection. And in so doing, lifts Christianity out of the mist of superstition and makes it the abiding faith of Christians throughout the centuries. When the message of the empty tomb and the risen Christ was whispered in the streets of Jerusalem and spread in the marketplaces of Corinth, Antioch, and Athens, it was shocking news. He is risen, they said. He is risen indeed. It quickly became the central message of these unlettered fishermen. Within 50 short days of the death of Jesus, the city of Jerusalem and the temple courts rang with the good news. He has been raised from the dead. With boldness, these fishermen declared that God had brought Jesus back to life. And everywhere the Apostle Paul went, he preached the message of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In Athens, in Corinth, in Philippi, Jesus lives and will judge the world. Those who heard the story of the resurrection had two responses. Some believed, but some sneered. And those who deny the physical resurrection of Jesus have offered numerous imaginative suggestions and theories in their attempts to discount the Easter message. Here's a couple of examples. First, there's the stolen body theory. This theory says that the disciples removed the body so they could hatch the myth of a resurrected Jesus. The stolen body theory was started on Easter Sunday as the priests went to Pilate and told him what they knew. But there's a number of flaws in that story. First of all, the disciples were in hiding. There is no way they would have been bold enough to come out in public and go up against the Roman guard in order to overpower them, roll back the stone, and then steal the body. Speaking of the soldiers, we know that for a Roman soldier, the penalty for falling asleep on watch was instant death. So I can't imagine that these soldiers who had been guarding the tomb, would go to their superior and support the story that they had been asleep and the disciples had snuck in and stolen the body. Secondly, there's also the wrong tomb theory. Maybe the women on Easter Sunday got their directions mixed up. <laughs> Maybe they were taking their page from men who are too proud to stop and get directions. <laughs> and so they went to the wrong tomb. And they showed up at a tomb that was already empty. And when they saw that there was no body inside, they began the story that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Now the problem with that is it was that angel we heard about in today's gospel lesson who announced to them at the tomb why it was empty. 
And in another gospel version, I love the verse that says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has been raised as he said. We've also got in John chapter 20, the story of John and Peter, who upon hearing the story of the resurrection, rush to the tomb, go inside, and see the burial cloths that had previously been wrapped around Jesus' body. So no, the wrong tomb theory just doesn't work. Third is the swoon theory. <laughs> the idea that Jesus never really died. Remember, he was given drugs while he was on the cross. A sponge soaked in wine vinegar and given to him to drink. Earlier, he had been offered a sponge dipped in a chemical that would have lessened his pain. So maybe Jesus didn't die. He just passed out. And they took the body down and put it in the tomb. And then later on, Jesus woke up, somehow got around that rock, <laughs> somehow got past those Roman soldiers, and went off on his way. Scripture doesn't support that either. Because we have the account of the crucifixion where after Jesus had been hanging there for a while, in order to hasten the death of the three who were being executed, the soldiers would come and break the legs of the people being crucified. They broke the legs of the two thieves, but did not break Jesus' legs because they saw he was already dead. Even so, one of the soldiers took a spear and thrust it into Jesus' side. And scripture records for us that blood and water flowed out. Now, I'm not going to get all fancy with you, but when you consider how Jesus was tortured prior to even being crucified, there is a, a medical condition where the body will draw water around the primary organs to try and protect them. That explains why Jesus was thirsty. But if the chest cavity is filled with water to protect the lungs and heart, then when the centurion stabs him with the spear, it would make sense that water would flow out. That could have only happened if Jesus was moments from death. So, no, he, he passed out and came back to life later, like so many sailors I knew. Just doesn't <laughs> hold water either. There's also the hallucination theory. These women didn't really see Jesus as they were coming back from the wrong tomb. They had a hallucination. No, that doesn't work either. The scripture says there were hundreds of people who claimed to have seen Jesus. And the idea of a mass hallucination makes no sense whatsoever. Finally, I love this one. This is the lost tomb theory. I read recently that a lost tomb of Jesus had been discovered. In March of this year, the Discovery Channel had a documentary in which they claimed several bone boxes had been discovered south of Jerusalem. They're called ossuaries, basically a common grave. And the names inscribed on these boxes were Mary, Joseph, Yeshua, or Jesus, and Judah, son of Jesus. Interesting, but hardly factual. Why would Jesus and his entire family be buried in Jerusalem? They were from Nazareth. <laughs> and his father Joseph was from Bethlehem, if we remember our Christmas stories correctly. There were thousands of women whose name was Mary. And hundreds of men whose name was Yeshua. Just look here in Glen Ewa, Harupa Valley, Riverside. How many Jesuses do you know? <laughs> There's a whole lot of Jesuses. Doesn't make them the Son of God. It just means they share his name. Just as Joshua did. 
So no, that theory doesn't make any sense either. And basically, when you put it all together, there's only one possible conclusion that we can reach. And that is that the story of the resurrection is a fact. It reality. It happened. And so what? What's the point of that? Well, you heard Paul saying in our New Testament lesson this morning that we are united with Christ. We die with him. We live with him. God cares for you. God loves you. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. I love that verse. Have life in abundance. We got to witness that just a few minutes ago when Sister Nancy stood up here and shared her beautiful music with you. Amen. Life in abundance. How many people do you know who are just going through the motions of life? They get up in the morning. They go to work. They work. They come home. They go to bed. They get up in the morning, they go to work, they come home, they go to bed. They get up in the morning, they go to work, they come home, they go to bed. How many people do you know for whom we can say life is just brand new day, same old, same old? The challenges we faced yesterday are still there today, and they'll still be there tomorrow. Think of that song from the TV show, Hee Haw. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. <laughs> Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> you know those people. They live near you. Maybe they live with you. <laughs> Maybe other people would say that about you. <laughs> You work with those people. You go to school with those people. They make you crazy because they're always negative. And every day is the same as the last. I can't tell you how many people I have had in counseling sessions over the years who are sharing with me that they have once again messed up their life, or that once again, life has gone bad for them. Everything bad always happens to me. Why is it me, Pastor? I don't know. Why not? Where's the guarantee that says your life is always going to be wonderful? There is not. Life is life. You get what you get. It's like you're going into a fantasy baseball league. And you let the computer pick your players for you. Because <laughs> you're too lazy to go online and pick them yourself. What you get is what you get. Rumor has it, I'm in first place. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad for somebody who hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> but you know the people I'm talking about? Doesn't Easter have anything to say to those people? Of course it does. This is the day of victory. This is the day we celebrate that today doesn't have to be like yesterday was. Today is the day we celebrate that we can be victorious over whatever it is that is troubling us in our lives. Amen. I'm working with somebody right now. He's in a, an awkward relationship, I'll put it that way. Having just gotten out of a very negative relationship, and now appears to be jumping right back into another one. Hello, McFly. Why are you doing that? Don't know. I guess he doesn't believe the resurrection story and doesn't believe he has enough value in God's eyes to seek a person in his life who could be of value to him. And I've worked with other people like that who go from one bad experience to another. And yet Easter is that day when life can be different. 
when life can be better. Maybe you have felt like you are on a treadmill in life, working as hard as you can and winding up exactly where you started. Work, but never seem to make any progress. Charles Murray was a student at the University of Cincinnati and many years ago was preparing for the Summer Olympics. Because Charles had never been in a religious family and never gone to church, when he met his first Christians and they started to talk to him about how much God cared for him, he was understandably skeptical. He wasn't sure that anybody could love him the way they said God did. So over the semester, he engaged his Christian friends in numerous conversations about God's love. One night he decided to call one of his friends and said, tell me again about those verses in the Bible that says God cares about me. And so his friend read from the 28th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, the same resurrection story I read to you just a few minutes ago. After he hung up, he decided he would go out over to the university pool and practice his sport. Now because he was preparing for the Olympics, he had special privileges. And he was allowed into the pool building even after hours. So he got himself in and climbed up the platform and prepared for his first dive. He didn't bother to turn the lights on because there was glass ceiling above him. And there was enough moonlight coming in so that he could see his way around. So he got up onto the platform, turned his back to the pool, and prepared to do a backward dive into the pool. And as he lifted his arms, the moonlight cast a shadow on the wall in front of him. The shadow of a cross. And he was suddenly struck that this was how God showed how much he loved him. And for the first time, he realized that Christ had died for him. And that this resurrection story meant he could have a new, a rich, and a wonderful life. At that moment, the janitor came in and flipped on the lights. That's when Charles turned around to discover that the pool had been drained for repair. He prayed, Jesus, come into my life and make a difference. He sat there in the dark for a long time, pondering just how precious he was in God's eyes. The same way you are precious in God's eyes. You matter to God. He loved you so much that he came to earth to die for you. Loved you so much that God brought him back to life so that you could be brought back to life. So that you and I can be assured of God's peace in our hearts and an eternal home in heaven. He is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. We worship God with our offering.